Dear students, today I will talk about the histological structure of the bones and start describing the bone development. As you know, the large number of human tissues are divided into four major groups, which, what we name, which named basic tissues, and among them the connective and supportive tissues characterized by the large quantity of intercellular substance, and this is not only large quantity, but this is what is the most important in their function. Uh, the connective and supportive tissues are classified along the functionally most important components of those tissue groups in which the microscopically visible components, the fibers, make the primary role, we name connective tissues, and those group of uh, such a tissues in which the non-visible molecular level interfibrous uh, substance makes the uh, functionally most important component, these are the supportive tissues. Uh, the bones belong to the supportive tissues because the most important characteristics is that they are hard, and their hardness is due to the precipitated inorganic salts, calcium salts. Uh, you are pretty much familiar with the bones uh, from the dissecting room, and let's see what kind of features they are. Uh, the uh, most important features, this is a solid tissue, and its solidity is due to the so-called calcium salts, further details later on. Uh, this is also contains a lot of collagen fibers, and because due to these collagen fibers is very durable. Without collagen fibers, it would be that fragile as a clay, as a, uh, which is just consisted of uh, inorganic substances, and the structure is pretty much uh, looks like the composite plastics. Probably you remember from materials which made of uh, fiberglass and uh, a kind of embedded into plastic, from which even car bodies are made. It's very stable. Uh, the weight of the uh, bones is lighter than it would be if it were stuff because it has a hollow structure. Uh, in the outer surface, the, the cortical area, this is compact. This is a thick, uh, stable bone which protects the sensitive inner part, and the medulla part is spongy just to reduce the weight without sacrificing the strength. These beams, which makes uh, located in the spongy part, is very well structured and organized. Uh, this is uh, very similar to the uh, uh, bridges. You remember the ancient bridges when the engineering was not very really well developed, very big mass was necessary to uh, build up a bridge. Nowadays, just a few wires, which are very carefully uh, designed, can uh, hold up very strong bridges. Uh, they try to mimic the uh, uh, bony beams inside the, the bone and couldn't find any better way for the good compromise between the strength and the way, so it's very well structured. Another medical importance of these beams is it's uh, very well visible in X-ray picture, and in the bones we have no sensory buds. We do not feel anything inside the bones. So evil things like cancer, uh, better sarcoma, uh, or uh, infection can progress without knowing it. Uh, the, the only thing which what we become aware of is that in X-ray picture, these beams are distorted. This is why it's worth studying them. The, the bone lifts. It has a very rich blood supply, and it continuously rebuilds itself, remodels itself. Uh, uh, this is uh, due to the adapt is, uh, uh, for the adaptation for the environment. If you do not use our bones, like all the other organs, it reduces, it lo loses pretty much of its content, uh, reduces the weight. And for instance, if you lie in bed for uh, sickness for a long period of time, and but if you have strong uh, work. Uh, uh, manual work, mechanical work, it becomes stronger and stronger. Moreover, depending on the direction of the burden, uh, the beams will resettle each other, so I always standing in a direction which makes it them easier, more tolerate the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, burden. Uh, in the bones, probably now from the uh, dissecting room, we have the 
uh, opening on the bone. These are the foramen nutritium. These are the points where the supplying blood vessels uh, step into the bone. What are the roles of the bone? The bones uh, have in our body have two roles. Number one, it ensures the endoskeleton, which is the internal solid structure of our body. Uh, just uh, a little additional piece of information. A couple of million years ago, milliard years ago, all the living creatures lived in the sea. The sea hold the, held them up, so they didn't have, uh, didn't have to get any kind of uh, solid uh, body parts. Whenever we climbed out to the dry land, we immediately needed a solid framework for our body. Uh, the living creatures solved this problem in two ways. Some of them made an outer shell uh, uh, for that. These are the insects. And this has an ad additional advantage protecting the sensitive inner organs. There is a very big disadvantage of this that cannot grow. It's very difficult to grow because they have to shed off uh, the uh, uh, exoskeleton, the outer skeleton, and prepare a new one which is very sensitive and cannot be done after a certain way. This is why the insect will not grow under further things. The other group of animals, like the vertebrates, has an internal skeleton which let the uh, internal sensitive organ most uh, 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 easier exposed to damage. However, the growing was not uh, limited. Let's see the whales. The other important structure of the bones is an important calcium store. Calcium is one of the most important uh, uh, transmitters, signal transmitters in our body, both intracellularly and between the cells. They must have a very even, very standard blood level, and a slight increase and decrease might have a serious consequences. And because the calcium intake is not uh, regular, not even, uh, the uh, bones are which buffers it. If you take in less calcium than it necessary, it dissolves from the calcium because these processes, these regulatory processes are much more important than the bone. If we eat more calcium than necessary, it will deposit that into the bone. So the bone is a very important buffer for the calcium metabolism. Uh, what is the structure of the bone? Whenever the bone is newly made, made, it is a kind of irregular structure. This is what we made primary network-like structure. And uh, this will be soon rebuilt to the very regular secondary structure, what we named the lamellar bone. They call this the cylindric structure, which meant concentric elements in a very regular way. Uh, this concentric element is the unit of the bone. We name the osteon, so this is a histological unit. One cylinder like this, with the concentric units inside, both cells and intercellular substance make a single osteon. Let's see what uh, we have inside. Uh, this is the uh, implementation of the osteons. In the middle, we have a canal, which was what he named the Haversian canal. Many of the components of the bone named after Havers, because Havers was the, uh, the uh, scientist who first described the structure of the human bone. Uh, the, in the Haversian canals, we have vessels, arteries and veins, and we have also nerves. As I mentioned, the bones has no sensory nerves, and Actually, it's a, it makes no sense to have a kind of motoric nerve. The nerve it is, is autonomic. This controlling the uh, blood supply of the uh, bone, acting on the wall of the arteries. Uh, be, uh, around the Haversian canal, we have concentric uh, rings of uh, the cells, bone cells, the osteocytes. This is, looks like insects running around. Uh, the an osteocytes is a flat oval structure with many, many processes. You can see this is a kind of electron microscopic reconstruction. This is a realistic picture taken from a ground bone, whatever you will see. And this is a very beautiful scanning electron microscopic picture where you can ha have a good impression how an osteocyte looks like. You become familiar with two terms, the laculae and caniliculae ossei. 
This is used only in histology, uh, and this describes the f uh, uh, these two uh, labeled area. Whenever we make, as you see later on in the details, a preparation from the bone, you, we dry out the osteocytes. However, we left the cavity, and this cavity is filled with ink. The cavity, the remnant of the uh, body of the osteocytes and also the processes, and whatever area the cell body was, named the lacuneosei and canalios oculiosei, are these narrow tunnels in which the processes of the other cells are. With these processes, the cells are in contact with the neighborhood cells, and uh, we have connections, gap junctions between the cells to let easier pass nutrition, oxygen, and whatever. The reason for that will be described soon. Between two cell rings, between two osteocyte rings, we have the intercellular substance of the bone. A unit, a cylindric unit of, the in, uh, of this intercellular substance, so between two neighborhood osteocytes named lamina specialis. Lamina specialis is about, about five to seven micrometer in thickness. This is the distance, the usual distance between two neighborhood osteocytes. So once again, the lamina specialis is intertissue substance, doesn't include the cells, and this is between two neighborhood osteocyte rings. Uh, the, what kind of components are there? These components are uh, practically the components of the interstitial substance. The most important, the most characteristic component is the uh, uh, calcium phosphate, uh, complex calcium phosphate uh, uh, precipitated uh, uh, chemical, which is identical in hydroxyapatite. Uh, why is that name? Calcium, as you know from or inorganic chemistry, that the inorganic salts sometimes might have different crystal forms. And one of the crystal forms, I think it has almost 15 different crystal forms, one of them is the mineral hydroxyapatite, and exactly the same crystal form, and only that is located in our bone. Uh, these uh, crystals are needle-like crystals, about 40 nanometer in length and 3 nan uh, nanometer in diameter, and this is practically what they look like under a uh, scanning electron microscope. Of course, these crystals are not completely free, they are embedded. If they were free, the bone behaved like a, a, a bucket of sand. Uh, the second component is the collagen fibers, as I briefly mentioned before, the durability of the bone due to the uh, collagen fiber content. The collagen fibers, we have a very big mass of collagen fibers in a bone. Uh, this is one of the reasons why just for bone you can cook a very healthy soup with a very protein-rich soup, because by cooking, as you studied in the previous lectures, the collagen can be dis dissolved and it gets into the soup. Uh, the collagen fibers are located in a very uh, well-organized way. They are running parallel to each other in a spiral way in one single thing. Some of the examiners like to hear that these are type 1 uh, uh, collagen fibers. Interestingly enough, if you have two neighborhood uh, lamina specialis, the, in the neighbor, the collagen fibers also run spiral way, parallel to each other, but to the B-neighbor is run crossed. And this makes a very durable structure. Uh, probably you are familiar with the plywood, in which there's a thin lamina of wood, in which we have longitudinal uh, uh, running uh, parts. It's very easy to break. However, if we stick two, three layers of such a thing, just right angle to each other, in one, the, uh, uh, actually the fibers run this way, in the other one, the opposite way, it makes a very durable stuff, even a very thin uh, wood, we can make very strong furniture. This is the principle what is used in our bone in, uh, with the crossed running collagen fibers. Uh, another important thing is the so-called Sharpie fibers. 
Sharpie fibers is not a fiber, but a principle describing that those collagen fibers, which are components of the bone, when they reach the surface of the bone, not end, but become continuous with any kind of collagen fibers contain, containing structure, like tendons and ligaments. And moreover, both in tendons and ligaments, the collagen fibers doesn't stop, go all the way to the next bone and become embedded to the next bone. Consequently, an uninterrupted collagen fiber bundle bridge is between two bones. And this is why the ligaments, and you will see later on also tendons or muscles, will connect very reliably and strongly to neighborhood bones together. This is why if we overburden our ligaments, it's either it breaks in the middle or breaks a piece of bone out but never uh, uh, separates from the surface of the bone. And this type of Sharpie fiber principle connection ensures for that. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, third component of the lamina specialis, the third type of component beside the, the calcium salts and the collagen fibers is a ground substance. Ground substance, like all in the other tissues, they serve for a kind of integrations. They are proteoglycans. Uh, the, you remember in the previous lecture in COVID with the cartilages, I gave a detailed description on that, and also heard earlier with the connective tissue. And these make a kind of jelly-like substances into which these other two components are embedded. If you hear this expression, osteocalcin, osteopontin, C-level protein, these are various subtypes of the uh, proteoglycans which are present in the bone. As I mentioned, the function is substance integration. This jelly-like uh, uh, substance will glue together the crystals and the collagen fibers. Uh, in the osteon, we have 5 to 20 rings, and the number of the rings is uh, limited by the feeding principle. Uh, as you know, that only uh, location where we have vessels in the osteon is middle, in the Haversian canals. Those cells, which are, are very good position dense and very good, they are in the innermost ring, and they directly pick up food from the arteries. They consume a bit of it, and they give it over to the next ring. They also consume a bit of it, give it over to the next ring. And the further away a cell is from the Haversian canal, the less oxygen and less nutrition it gets. Consequently, up to 20 ring can be fed this way. This is why this is the maximum of the rings you can find in a bone. Beside the osteon, we have so-called secondary structure elements in the bone. One of them is the Falkman's canal. Uh, this is the arteries which connecting two neighborhood arteries in two neighborhood osteons. So this is one artery, this is another artery, and the connection between them is named the Falkman's canal. The other thing is the intercanal lamellus. A space cannot be filled completely with cylinders. You can see between the cylinders, we have arch-like structures. Actually, these are not built just to fill up the gaps, but it's a secondary remnant of the trunk building. Whenever the bone is built, rebuilt, osteoclasts drill a tunnel. They don't know, uh, see where they are. They drill a tunnel, and from that outside to inside, as you will see later on in the details in animation of the next lecture, we'll build the ostone. This is the remnant of the old ostone. Similar thing is visible here uh, very well in the uh, ground bone structure, or this one and so on. Uh, these cells will make contact with the newly made ostone cells, and they just keep survive. Another <clears throat> uh, occurrence of the uh, 
lamina, a lamina specialis or intercellular substance of the bone is the fundamental or general lamellas and these are very huge uh, structures covering the entire surface of the bone. The bone uh, inside consists of cylindric structure and the surface would be very uneven and these smoothing off these many layers of large uh, uh, in spatial lamella-like structures, these are the fundamental general lamellas, make smoothing of. These, they are external on the outer surface and the internal surface where we have the bone marrow cavity. Uh, the additional structure is the periosteum. Periosteum is a dense collagenous connective tissue which is firmly attached to the surface of the bone and make a very important service function. It contains uh, vessels and the nerves. The vessels will uh, feed the bone, they send in the uh, branches and finally they end up in the arteries of the osteons and the nerves are real sensory nerves. As I mentioned, inside the bone, we have no sensory buds and sensory nerve, but in the periosteum we have many. If you hurt yourself, you have a sport accident, for instance, kicking or hitting your tibia or whatever, and it hurts very much, the feeling comes from the periosteum, not from the bone itself, because this makes a little swelling and this will make a pressure on these sensory buds. That's about the histological structure, most important details of the histological structure of the bones. In the following, I like to describe a couple of histological methods. How can we study the bone? Uh, making slides of the bone is not easy because the uh, uh, calcium phosphate is so hard that it will ruin very soon the blade by means of which we should do usual slide. We have to do some tricks to study the structure of the bone. One of the, method, uh, one of the possibilities is quite obvious that when we dissolve the calcium phosphate, then the bone can be uh, make slide of them, slice of them and study it as usually. The easiest way is to use acids. Any kind of acid like hydrochloric acid or acidic acid dissolves very well the uh, calcium salts and the remnant tissue can be made, make uh, uh, microscopic slides of it and study it. It's a very uh, nice thing if you've never done in the middle school that you get a kind of, after a dinner, you get a piece of chicken bone, uh, just wash off the uh, fat and put in the glass with uh, vinegar, a, 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 a acetic acid, and leave it there with, for a week. After a week, you cannot see anything on the bone apparently, but if you take out the bone, you can make a knot on that. It's become very uh, soft, like a uh, rubber. This is why the inorganic substance will dissolve and the organic substance, fibers and proteoglycans remain. Uh, this one is too tough for the histological purpose because they destroy the other tissues as well. The mildal form of dissolving the calcium phosphate is the chelating acid, like EDTA and similar things. And this can be facilitated with electrolysis, passing uh, the current, uh, uh, direct current through the uh, uh, tissue, tissue block to facilitate the movement of the ions. The other is a different principle, this is a so-called ground bone. This is very tedious to work, uh, and to make, and the, it's made briefly the following way. We get a piece of bone and let it dry. The cell dries and shrinks. After that, we make a, uh, get a file and make a one millimeter thin slide. Somebody with a certain dexterity can do that. This slice will be immersed into a dye. This dye is named the basic fuchsin. And uh, this basic fuchsin is named after the color because the same color as the acidic fuchsin, which is used to the past, but completely different chemical. The most important feature is it's not soluble in water, but it is soluble in alcohol. If you get an alcoholic solution, the alcohol diffuses much quicker, by the way, uh, 
to compare to the water. It goes into the tunnels and all the cavities in the bone. And if, you, if, if this dye is in a large quantities, you can see black area and the smaller quantities uh, show up as violet colored. Uh, after that, the, uh, uh, this one millimeter thing slide started to get ground between two rough glass particles. We grind it, getting thinner and thinner. And when it reaches 20 micrometer thickness, which is used to study, usually it breaks into little pieces and we can start the work again and again. Whenever we are skillful enough to get a 20 micrometer thick things, we will cover uh, as a usual slide and we study it. This is what you see in the uh, histology room. Because every single slide is made by a very tedious job. If you get into your hand such a, a slide, take care of it. OK, this was the uh, structure and the histological studies of the bone. Uh, let's start another topic, the bone formation. Usually, the development of the tissues is not described separately because the principle is very easy. We get mesenchymal cells, mesenchymal cells divide, and on a certain biological signal, they differentiate into the certain area, they further divide, and making this particular organ. Because the organ is soft, they can grow from, uh, from inside and, uh, until they reach the final size. The bone cannot develop this way because you know the bone is hard and cannot grow. So this is not uh, developed from directly from the mesenheim, but first a structure is made which is soft and the same size uh, and shape as the final object, at least in particular age, like in the embryonic, certain period of embryonic life, and then this tissue will be transformed without changing the size and the shape to bone. Uh, the uh, primary tissue from which uh, uh, the bone develops can be connective tissue. In this case, we named it intramembranaceous or endosmal ossification. Intramembranaceous means that the connective tissue usually do not like to make blocks, just membranes. And this is why most of the bone formation is less flat blown, or endesmal is related to the connective tissue. The other possibility is that the intracartilaginous or cartilaginous or endochondral ossification, in which the primary tissue is a hyaline cartilage like cartilage. Now, let's briefly describe the intramembranous ossification. You, uh, the flat bones will uh, uh, develop this way. As I mentioned, uh, why the connective tissue likes to make membranes of flat objects. The only uh, exception is, or only additional thing is, that the endosmal ossification results in a much stronger, much durable bone than the intracartilaginous. Uh, consequently, those bones, which should be very tough, like the mandibule, it uh, undergoing a lot of forces, or the petrous bone, which houses the mechanical events, is very sensitive in a rear, uh, they develop in the intermembranous way. Uh, the typical thing is the top of the head, the calvaria. At a certain stage of the individual development, the brain is surrounded by a membrane, connective tissue membrane, and this will be transformed to bone step by step. Uh, five points appear there. The, from five points, the ossification starts, and this is what we named puntum ossificationis. From these points, the process spreading and finally re reaching each other. This is the situation whenever the baby is born, most of the head is already bony, but we have two areas where we have still the connective tissue. This is what we named fonticuluses or fontanels. Here, I, as you can see, a little animation shows the process. This is the birth, stage of the birth, and these fontanels disappear by the end of the first year. If they do not disappear or disappear earlier, we have a deep problem. Uh, the <coughs> when they disappear earlier, the skull will not grow enough, so 
the brain will compress and we have problems with the brain function. Whenever it uh, will not grow uh, together by the end of the first year, it means that some evil things happen inside. The brain grows more than that. Unluckily enough, not the brain itself, but there is a problem in circulation of the cerebrospinal fluid. And actually, the brain is blown up. And this shows a very severe brain development problems. We have two fontanelles at birth. The fonticulus major, the greater fontanel, which is uh, uh, the diamond shape and the small one, fonticus minor, which is triangular in shape. Once again, this is what uh, step by step disappear by the first um, uh, year of age. Uh, these things are used very well by the pediatricians. You will study for what purposes later on in fifth year. It's notable to say that these, the borderlines between these bone developments We'll, we'll have sutures at the end. You need the lambdoid suture, coronal suture, sagittal suture, and so on. But during the development, the frontal bone is, develops from two parts. We have an intrafrontal suture. This will completely disappear uh, at the end of the first year, but the rest of the connections remain. These five punctum ossificationes will persist in our life, it's feelable. If you feel your forehead, you can see two bumps here. This was the two frontal uh, punctum ossifications here. You have two temporal and one on back in the occipital bone, a feelable bump. This is how they develop. Now let's see how it, the, the development goes on. The first step is the mesenchymal cells, which start differentiating in a certain direction. Uh, probably you are familiar with a series of words which is this, uh, using for describe the developing cells. The stem cells can do everything, like a baby's. From the baby can be a lawyer, uh, uh, doctor, uh, uh, manual worker, and whatever, even if it's a stupid politician. And, but uh, there is no limit. Later on, uh, the uh, uh, child start thinking, I want to be this and this. Uh, this is what we name progenitor. It has a certain direction. Uh, I'm not interested in any other things, just a certain type of profession. For instance, you are medical doctor progenitors. You've never done any medical things so far, but you're pretty much aiming at the medical things. The progenitor cells histologically look like stem cells. You cannot see any alternation. However, already the genetic material is already is transformed. Many of the unwanted features, unwanted genes are sealed, and some of them remain open, whatever is necessary for a certain goal. Uh, these cells become activated, start working, and these are the blast cells. Blast cells are those cells which have really doing something. Because any kind of production in a cell based on proteins, like structure elements, structure proteins, enzymes, which is all the chemical factories and so on, the first thing any kind of blast cell must do is the large quantities of rough surface endoplasmatic reticulum. And this is, you know, the machinery of the protein synthesis. This is why every blast cell, doesn't matter whether it's osteoblast, chondroblast, whatever, uh, it has blue cytoplasm because the large quantities of, of the ribosomes make it staining blue. These are the cells with blue cytoplasm on the surface lined up in single rows. These are the osteoblasts. Osteoblasts start producing the intercellular substance of the bone, and this is, as you know, the collagen and the proteoglycans. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, uh, what we named osteoid. So this red substance, which is mostly collagen, the raw material of the collagen fibers, fibers will settle later on, and proteoglycans, we named it osteoid. So this is the organic part. The calcium precipitation happens, happens later on. Uh, 
the cells which made enough things, they become embedded and reduces the activity. Between these already transformed area, we have original areas in which we have a very loose tissue, we have vessels inside, and round cells are stem cells, some of them are dividing, and they will differentiate into osteoblasts. On the surface, all along you can see cells with blue cytoplasm, these are the osteoblast. This area is named the primitive bone marrow, not to be mixed with the permanent bone marrow, and primarily they carry vessels and uh, things. Uh, then, uh, later on, the cells, when they think they produce enough osteons, they stop reducing the activity, and they become osteocytes. This is the cells which are living long in the tissue. Uh, they do not produce much, uh, uh, intercellular substance in a higher speed, but they do need some kind of maintenance jobs, repairing whatever is went wrong. Additionally, they send out enzymes which make calcium phosphate precipitation. These lines, uh, these blue lines showing that, you know that calcium sustains blue with hematoxylin, and these bluish lines already the early sign of the calcium uh, precipitation uh, done by the enzymes sent out by the cells. Uh, the process is not finished yet, it's a very early stage, it's already the rebuilding starts. You can see these big, ugly looking multinucleated cells, these are the so-called osteoclasts, which destroying the newly made cells, making straight tunnels, and, and building up a regular lamellar bone with osteons. How it's made, I will show you a nice animation in the next lecture. And maybe some of the examiners likes this expression. The hope ship lacuna is an area around the uh, osteoclast, they're sending up very aggressive enzymes that dissolve everything, and this is, this is the area where the bone was dissolved. After that, the bone is already relatively solid, so if you want to grow a bone, a flat bone, we can add another layers on the surface. This is what is the oppositional growth. The mechanism of the osteoporosis growth was described in details in a previous lecture with the cartilages. The very same principle is also valid for the growing of the intramuscular ossification. This is what I wanted to talk about today, and next lecture I continue the development of bone with the intracartilaginous ossification and some general ideas on how the bone grows. Thank you very much for your attention.